Tusind tak og velkommen alle sammen. Oh, I'm just I'm feeling let out of my cage by Elika's talk. So I thought I'd launch into Danish. Did anybody are there any Danes here? No. Okay. You're all watching the killing reruns. Um, welcome to Linguamania, live Friday here at the Ashmolean. I'm Kirsten Shepherd Barr, and I'm acting director of Torch for this term. And here we have an opportunity to share research with the wider public and enjoy a late night in the museum. Linguamania has been curated by the research project team Creative Multilingualism. And you see lots of logos I'm blocking the view for, but it's a huge enterprise. Um, Torch is the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities, and we support and facilitate multidisciplinary research and enable wider and public engagement. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Park as our next speaker. Karen is an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh and linguist for the Ethno-Ornithology World Archive. Her research explores language change and loss in little-known Pacific dialects, theoretical approaches to structure and meaning in language, and language documentation and conservation. Dr. Park will be talking about musings from cloud cuckoo land. On that note, thank you for coming. say it's quite something to be introduced by a trumpet. Um, if it were a pipe, it would give me, if somebody came out on a flute or a pipe, a pan pipes, I could say, hey, that's led me straight into my talk because I'm talking about the words that the birds gave us. And pipe is one of those. It comes from peep, 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 the little songs that birds sang to us once upon a time. Um, what I want to start with, honestly, um, is this phrase you'll hear from time to time in English. It's all Greek to me. Um, and um, in Chinese, they have the same thing, but it's, it's, it's all bird language to me. And I think that's kind of amusing, because at least Greeks in our family, if you go back far enough into Indo-European, but bird language, they're doing a cross-species thing here that's rather exciting. But what's particularly interesting about it is that I feel there is, way back in our history, and even today as we create new words, there's something there that we have in the bones of our language little tiny delightful hints of cross-species borrowing. Um, and so that's what I'm going to play with a little bit today. And as I do that, I'm going to t kind of take you down some of, the, some of the paths we take as linguists, exploring language and then exploring the, the history of language, exploring the words. Um, I say this as musings from cloud cuckoo land for many reasons, but one of them is because I'm dancing a little bit on the edge of respectability with respect to linguistics. Um, so bear with me, those real linguists in the crowd. I'm going to do my best to put the warning signs up each time I tiptoe too near a, a ravine. Um, but, but here we go. Welcome to cloud cuckoo land. Um, I'm, starting, um, I'm starting with a, 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 a piece you might know. It's Plato's Cratylus, so those of you who do classics um, probably have heard of this. But it's, it's the, um, the correctness of names. So there's an age-old question. It's the question of where did language come from? What are the origins of language? And, and here we have, um, through, through Plato, we've got the Greeks arguing about it way back in the 5th century BC. Um, the setup for this story, for those of you who aren't um, steeped in the classics, is that Socrates, our wise old Socrates, is asked by, by two men, um, Hermogenes and Cratylus, um, are, names, are names conventional or natural? Where do words come from? Is it arbitrary? Or is there something, is there something to it? Is there something to the chair you're sitting on that has something very cherry to it? Um, is there something, something to, um, oh, I'm trying to think, um, a bird that makes it bird? And so is there something natural that connects us to language? Or is it all just convention? Is it just in a social agreement that, that um, we'll use these words to communicate guys and we'll understand each other? Um, so this, this question goes way back. Um, and I, I could give you Socrates. Socrates gives us, um, there's, there's, they go back and forth. Um, Hermogenes argues for a conventional um, perspective. He says, nothing but local or national convention, um, which words are used to designate which objects. Um, Cratylus is a naturalist. He says they cannot be arbitrarily chosen because names belong naturally to their specific objects. He felt there was something there. Um, Socrates responds, but if the primary names are to be ways of expressing things clearly, is there any better way of getting them to be such than by making them, each of them, as much like the thing it is to express as possible? 
Or do you prefer the way proposed by Hermogenes and many others who claim that names are conventional signs that express things to those who already knew the things before they established the conventions? They're, they're really interesting questions when we think about even what a miracle language is. Um, I'm going to pause there for a bit, but this question continued and, and honestly continues to riddle us. Um, but I'm going to bring you to a, a, a man in linguistics who did a great deal for us just in terms of our ability to study language. And this is Fernando Sassor. So let's move ahead 2,000 years into the future. Um, sort of the, the end of the um, mid-19th mid to the beginning of the 20th century. He's a Swiss linguist and a semitician, so he's working with signs. Um, actually, he was a brilliant linguist in his own right, um, and, and somebody who worked in um, the history of languages as well, and did some very great work early in his career. Um, but the work that at least I as a linguist know him for best is his course in general linguistics. And what's amusing about this work is that he didn't even write it. He gave it as a series of lectures to his students. And, and, and after he died, it was, they were such beautiful, powerful, important ideas for the study of language, they wrote up his notes in the book that became the course in general linguistics. Um, um, or if you forgive my terrible French, Corps de Linguistique Générale, um, as it was originally published in the French. Um, but what he gave us, he gave us some very clear ways of thinking about language. Um, and, and one of the, the one that he calls as the first principle of linguistics is that the linguistic sign is arbitrary. So if you go back to this argument between Hermogenes and Cratylus, um, he's saying, Cratylus, you're wrong. Hermogenes is right. It's conventionalism. That, that the, the, the words that we choose to communicate, it is arbitrary. There's no reason that I say sister and, um, well, let me think, let me think of a better example. Um, because uh, that's too close to family things. But there's no reason that I would say something like um, bird in English, and, and in Fiji they'd say manu manu um, that there's, there, It says they're just so arbitrary that we're going to have different ways to approach that. Um, and it, it gives us a certain freedom in terms of thinking about language. He's also responsible for giving us some other great ideas, how you look at language in time, um, how you think about, um, about just language as a, as a system. But um, we're going to play with this arbitrary idea. So we're going to take we're going to take Cratylus forward. Um, so there's some interesting things going on when you do arbitrariness. Um, not only is the connection of the word, the chair, to the thing, an arbitrary connection, an agreement, but there's also the way we break up reality. And so we've got this this example in in brother and sister. In in English, we break it up brother and sister. If you're doing it in Chinese, you're going to break it into little brother and big brother. There's not a simple word for brother, there are two words. And so the arbitrariness applies even to how you're approaching the breaking up of the world um, into things. Um, so we, we start with that in linguistics, and this is a really powerful concept. Um, the linguistic sign, it's this, this matching, if we're speaking in sounds, it's the matching of the sounds that my auditory system makes, and, um, and ideas and concepts. If you're doing sign language, it's the matching of the signs, then, and the concepts. Um, and generally, language works across those, those two forms. Um, this, the implications of arbitrariness are huge. It, gave, um, it, it supported historical linguistics in our study of language change. So uh, another big area of, of linguistic research, particularly in the 19th century, very powerful, was, was, was the study of how languages have changed. And there's some big ideas in that, too, this observation that sound change is regular. But to even allow that language can change, you need to have a certain amount of arbitrariness to the system. If the words themselves are completely connected to the things they represent, then you'd think they'd hold their form a little bit better, don't you? Um, but, but the fact that there's, there is this flexibility means language has changed. And so that gives us a little bit of an entry into to, to sort of how we can explain what's going on when linguists are out there looking at language change. Um, so, so it helps with, with some of the concepts of how languages change, come into being, evolve, die. Um, it, and it shows how change can affect every aspect of language. And so if you think about language again, we've got, um, we've got words, we've got sounds, we've got structure. And through these, these little organized systems, we've got infinite creativity. So I can stand up here slightly nervous and spout things I'm not sure I meant to a few minutes ago, but I can stand up here and tell you things that I didn't, um, 
that nobody might have said before. Um, so there are these systems, and, and language change affects every aspect of that. Um, and this concept of arbitrariness helps us in that study. Um, it also helps us in, in, in a very different area in linguistics, in the study of, of what is it cognitively, what is language in our brain. And it, it gives us that freedom between, between are there cognitive bases and then there's an arbitrary system that works within that. And so, so Fernanda saw sort of this concept of the linguistic sign is arbitrary was powerful just in our foundation and our ability to take some of our linguistic theories forward to where they've gone. Um, so now I'm going to take you. Um, this is Nephokokia. That's, if you go back to Aristophanes, that's the original um, cloud cuckoo land. And you can kind of hear it in the name, can't you? Kokia. Um, but um, so let's go to cloud cuckoo land a little bit. Um, and I know I've danced upon this awfully quickly, but hopefully I've given you just a bit of a basis for the concept of the arbitrary nature of the sign. Because I want to look at the, the bird name. Let's, let's, go, let's go back to the game that Cratylus and Hermogenes were playing, but do it, do it with respect to, um, to naming again. And let's take birds. And I've got to stay honest on time. So what's in a bird name? And, and what you find is that there's a lot in a bird name. There's, um, there's the song. So cuckoo, cuckoo, you've got that. Um, that's a bird that's named itself. There's its look. So there you've got an eastern bluebird. There's its history. So cormorant comes from um, cormoran in the old French. Um, and ultimately back to Latin, corvus marinus, which means sea raven. So you've got, they, they actually carry a lot of things that don't feel arbitrary. And what you've got to think about, though, is that the system. So some words themselves are they're not arbitrary, but they're not arbitrary within the system, the language system. So if you're going to come to, to the Eastern Bluebird from Dutch, it's not going to make much sense to you. But it, it is sensible to somebody who speaks English. So you still have, you have the language system. But there are other words where the, the onomatopoeic stuff isn't. It has an echo of something that's out there in the real world. So it's a little, it's a little area of linguistics, if you will, and I'd still be careful with this, where the linguistic sign is less arbitrary. Now, we're still translating those sounds into our phonetic alphabets. And that's why um, when I say hoo hoo for the owl, somebody else is going to give it um, a very different, a different sound. Um, and so here I've got um, um, English ka ka for the crow. In Turkish, I'm told it's gok gok. So we are still translating these sounds into our own linguistic systems. Um, but what can we do with this? <sighs> oh, I have a slight diversion, guys. But it's, it's, it's so much fun. This is, this is, there's something to this, and this is why I want to play with birdsong and language. Um, and, and so there's something first in our ability to hear a birdsong and have that bird name itself. So the cuckoo calls itself the cuckoo. But there's also something in um, our ability to hear a sound and translate it into our language. And, and we humans seem to have just an innate desire to do this. It's those of us who look at the moon and see the man on it. You know that, that, that ability we have visually when we look at things and find images in them, even in the chaos. Um, I feel we do something similar with sound. And so you've got across languages, you've got us taking bird songs and also giving them statements. So you've got the Eastern bluebird in America saying, cheer, cheerful. Um, and across other languages, you've got some birds that seem to more reflect their character. So, um, this Walpuri Creston Bellbird, pa 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 la la, um, yana yana paka paka, he doesn't like people. So he's calling out to the, the evil spirits in the forest to go hit the people. So they have these things that, that we take the bird song, but we're hearing things in it. Um, I'm staying at a friend's house right now, and his darn little bathroom exact, ex exhaust fan is telling me to wash my hands, I swear. Um, all right, so that's a slight diversion, but there is something human in terms of finding, finding meaning in the nonsense and the sounds of our world. And think about us as people. Think about us as people who are interacting with rural environments and, and, and what we're doing with that. All right, away from the distraction, I'm taking you back to another process in linguistics. And this is this powerful tool we've had since the 19th century for chasing the histories of words. This is the um, comparative method. And one thing that was observed um, by the neogrammarians, by 19th century linguists, is that there's a regular pattern to sound change. Sound change is regular. And through that, you can take languages that seem to have shared 
um, shared forms in their words, combined with shared meaning, and you can, you can compare them and trace their histories to show that they might have a common ancestor and even start recreating that common ancestor. That's how we come from English to Indo-European. So up here I just have a quick glimpse of the process where you'll get a set of words across languages and then following some patterns that we, we, we know as linguists, sort of going back and recreating the origins of words. This is wonderful um, with words that aren't echoic. But as soon as you toss something like onomatopoeia in the mix, it gets weird. And so here I've got an example of the great vowel shift. And this shows you how we pronounce words from Chaucer through Shakespeare to Lingua Mania 2017. And um, what we've got down there, that little obnoxious bird, is down there saying peep, 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 all the way through. Now if you compare the peep to the um, bite up under Chaucer, Chaucer under Chaucer, bite was um, pita, pita. And, and it evolves through this vowel change to finally giving us bite. So if peep had followed the same natural language change processes, we would have pipe. The birds would no longer be peeping, but they didn't get the message. They're still out there peeping. So, um, so this is why we're careful with onomatopoeia. When we do language, we're very, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a place to tiptoe around a little bit. We leave it out of the word histories because we can't, we don't have that that process, that language process going on. But it, but it does carry something. And here I'm going to play a bit of a trick on you. Um, and it's a quick trick because I've got to leave soon. Um, but here's my trick. Um, I'm going to play the cuckoo game. Honest to goodness, though, um, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, cuckoo was a later borrowing from, from French, um, from old French. So this is not a fair game, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so let's say cuckoo is the call. Cuckoo. Um, marvelous, a bird named itself. But um, cuckold is the bird's reputation. It's the bird that lays its, um, you know, the, the male bird has to raise someone else's chick. That's the problem. Um, and what's interesting is that you've got cuckoo, you've got that sound. The bird holds on to its name. But cuckold um, shows a couple things. It shows a culture that's completely connected with an environment, enough to know the behavior of that bird. And, they, and through metaphor, if you will, through storytelling, they apply that to people as well. And you get this word that now I think is becoming somewhat archaic, but, but for a while had a quite, you know, was rather insulting. Um, but, um, but that's its behavior. But what you see in the, the change of the vowels is that one's become more part of our language system. So it shifted away from the echoic and it started following more of the natural processes of change. So how do you find, that one's a nice one because you've got the rhythm, you've got the sounds, it's still there, you've got the behavior, but how do you find that as it continues? Another thing is it's not its only reputation. The cuckoo's a delightful bird and bringing in the spring. Um, so thank you very much, cuckoo. Um, we can take that beyond the cuckoo, and this is what's fun. You've got the raven, um, ka, and that's hrafen, ha, ha, you hear that in its name. You've got the, the call of the rooster. So you've got these sounds, you've got these songs that you start thinking, whoa, the rooster call, I bet my cocktail comes from that. Um, how do we find that? Why do we trace it? And, and raven, ra, I was thinking, well, maybe ravenous, ravenous, or a rave, a rove, but no. The only one that I can comfortably trace back to the raven, and, that's, and I'm cheating there because I'm going for a crow, is corbel. Um, and that comes from a, a Latin root, um, corvus, and um, it's because of the shape of the bird. So it's a, it's a tricky game to play, but it's, it's um, a delightful one. How do we do it? We do it with the experimental, um, we do it with the comparative method. We do it carefully. Um, we work with linguists who spend a great deal of time um, studying these processes. But what I want to argue, and that's why I'm bringing us straight back to cloud cuckoo land, is that these, these bits of onomatopoeia, these little bits of cross-species communication are fascinating. They tell us so much about who we are, about our connections with our environment, um, about just the, the nature that the, the people have in terms of, of taking sounds they hear, the stories they tell, how they see themselves. And, and we can play this out in English, but another way to play it out is, is, is cross-culturally. And though we as, and I'm speaking from America, I fled, I fled this week, um, but um, <laughs> Um, we as Westerners are moving away from a very rural um, environment in terms of where we live and work into one that's much more urban, and you see that in the words that we coin now. Um, but there are a lot of cultures that still have that tight connection, and you start to see parallels across, across our language systems, across how we interpret the sounds in the world. 
And, um, and, and so if, if you take these ideas and then try to see how that creative process is being used across languages of the world, maybe that gives us another window into how we can start thinking about onomatopoeia and what it can tell us about ourselves and our own histor historic um, relationship with our environments and our birds. So thank you very much for wandering a rather questionable path with me tonight.